Okay, good evening, everybody. Hello, and um, happy World Theatre Day, um, as it nationally is known as today. So I hope that you have managed to celebrate in some way by watching or reading some theatre. Um, so we are going to continue with our story, uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. Um, which is an, originally a novel but was turned into a play and has very successfully been performed in the West End theatres in London and toured around the country as well in the past few years. Um, just a brief recap um, so that you can remember the story and if anybody is joining us for the first time, this is the story of a teenage boy who finds a dead, a dead dog in his neighbour's garden. It's his neighbor's dog called Wellington. And Christopher um, is very intrigued as to what has happened to Wellington and how he has died. And he is very, very keen to investigate it. And what becomes apparent with Christopher is that he um, has some learning difficulties. He kind of thinks and behaves in a different way, um, though it's never explicitly said in the story uh, what his needs are, okay? But if you listen carefully, you can see that he thinks and behaves in a different way. So bear that in mind when you're thinking about this teenage boy and how he's dealing with this situation. And so far, all we know is um, the dog has died and that Christopher uh, lives with his dad and he is um, obsessed with space and maths and science and that his teacher is a lady called Siobhan and she has encouraged him to write a story, okay? So we will continue. <clears throat> I do not tell lies. Mother used to say that this was because I was a good person. But it is not because I am a good person. It is because I can't tell lies. Mother was a small person who smelt nice. And sometimes she wore a fleece with a zip down the front, which was pink. A lie is when you say something happened which didn't happen but there is only ever one thing which happened at a particular time and a particular place. And there are an infinite number of things which didn't happen at that time and that place. And if I think about something which didn't happen, I start thinking about all the other things which didn't happen. For example, this morning for breakfast, I had red, ready breakfast and some hot raspberry milkshake. But if I say that I actually had shreddies and a mug of tea, I start thinking about Cocoa Pops and lemonade and porridge and Dr Pepper and how I wasn't eating my breakfast in Egypt and there wasn't a rhinoceros in the room and father wasn't wearing a diving suit and so on. And even writing this makes me feel shaky and scared like I do when I'm standing on the top of a very tall building and there are thousands of houses and cars and people below me and my head is so full of these things that I'm afraid that I'm going to forget to stand up straight and hang onto the rail and I'm going to fall over and be killed. This is another reason why I don't like proper novels because they are lies about things which didn't happen and they make me feel shaky and scared. And this is why Everything I have written here is true. There were clouds in the sky on the way home from the police station, so I couldn't see the Milky Way. I said, I'm sorry, because father had had to come to the police station, which was a bad thing. He said, it's okay. I said, I didn't kill the dog. And he said, I know. Then he said, Christopher, you have to stay out of trouble, okay? I said, I didn't know I was going to get into trouble. I like Wellington and I went to say hello to him, but I didn't know that someone had killed him. Father said, just try and keep your nose out of other people's business. I thought for a little and I said, 
I am going to find out who killed Wellington. And father said, were you listening to what I was saying, Christopher? I said, yes, I was listening to what you were saying. But when someone gets murdered, you have to find out who did it so that they can be punished. And he said, it's a bloody dog, Christopher, a bloody dog. I replied, I think dogs are important too. He said, leave it. I said, I wonder if the police will find out who killed him and punish that person. Then father banged on the steering wheel with his fist and the car weaved a little bit across the dotted line in the middle of the road and he shouted, I said, leave it for God's sake. I could tell that he was angry because he was shouting and I didn't want to make him angry. So I didn't say anything else until we got home. When we came in through the front door, I went into the kitchen and I got a carrot for Toby and I went upstairs and I shut the door of my room and I let Toby out and I gave him the carrot. Then I turned my computer on and played 76 games of Minesweeper and did the expert version in 102 seconds, which was only three seconds off my best time, which was 99 seconds. At 2.07 a.m., I decided that I wanted a drink of orange squash before I brushed my teeth and got into bed. So I went downstairs to the kitchen. Father was sitting on the sofa, watching snooker on the television and drinking whiskey. There were tears coming out of his eyes. I asked, are you sad about Wellington? He looked at me for a long period of time and sucked air in through his nose. Then he said, yes, Christopher, you could say that. You could very well say that. I decided to leave him alone because when I am sad, I want to be left alone. So I didn't say anything else. I just went into the kitchen, made my own squash and took it back upstairs to my room. Mother died two years ago. I came home from school one day and no one answered the door. So I went and found the secret key that we keep under the flower pot behind the kitchen door. I let myself into the house and carried on making an Airfix Sherman tank model that I was building. An hour and a half later, father came home from work. He runs a business and he does heating maintenance and boiler repair with a man called Rodri, who is his employee. He knocked on the door of my room and opened it and asked whether I had seen mother. I said that I hadn't seen her and he went downstairs and he started making some phone calls. I did not hear what he said. Then he came up to my room and said he had to go out for a while and he wasn't sure how long he would be. He said that if I needed anything, I should call him on his mobile phone. He was away for two and a half hours. When he came back, I went downstairs. He was sitting in the kitchen, staring out of the back window down window down the garden to the pond and the corrugated iron fence and the top of the tower of the church on Manstead Street which looks like a castle because it is Norman. Father said I'm afraid you won't be seeing your mother for a while. He didn't look at me when he said this. He kept on looking through the window. Usually people look at you when they're talking to you. I know that they're working out what I'm thinking but I can't tell what they are thinking. It is like being in a room with a one-way mirror in a spy film. But this was nice, having father speak to me, but not look at me. I said, why not? He waited for a very long time. Then he said, your mother has had to go into hospital. Can we visit her? I asked, because I like hospitals. I like the uniforms and the machines. Father said, no. I said, why can't we? And he said, she needs rest. She needs to be on her own. I asked, is it a psychiatric hospital? And father said, no, it's an ordinary hospital. She has a problem, a problem with her heart. I said, we will need to take food to her because I knew that food in hospital was not very good. David from school, he went into hospital to have an operation on his leg to make his calf muscle longer so that he could walk better and he hated the food, so his mother used to take meals in every day. Father waited a long time again and said, I'll take some into her during the day when you're at school, 
I'll give it to the doctors and they can give it to your mum, okay? I said, but you can't cook. Father put his hands over his face and said, Christopher, look, I'll buy some of those ready-made stuff from Marks and Spencer and I'll take those in. She likes those. I said it would make her a get well card because that is what you do for people when they're in hospital. Father said he would take it in the next day. In the bus, on the way to school the next morning, we passed four red cars in a row, which meant that it was going to be a good day. So I decided not to be sad about Wellington. Mr. Jeevons, the psychologist at school, once asked me why four red cars in a row made it a good day and three red cars in a row made it a quite good day. Five red cars in a row made it a super good day and why four yellow cars in a row made it a bad day. Which is a day when I don't speak to anyone and I sit on my own reading books and I don't eat my lunch and take no risks. He said that I was clearly a very logical person, so he was surprised that I should think like this because it wasn't very logical. I said that I liked things to be in a nice order. And one of the ways, one of the things being a nice order, and one way of things being in a nice order was to be logical, especially if those things were numbers or an argument. But there were other ways of putting things in a nice order. And that was why I had good days and bad days. And I said that some people who worked in an office came out of their house in the morning and saw that the sun was shining and it made them feel happy. Or they saw that it was raining and it made them feel sad. But the only difference was the weather. And if they worked in an office, the weather didn't have anything to do with whether they had a good day or a bad day. I said that when father got up in the morning, he always put on his trousers before he put his socks on. And it wasn't logical, but he always did it that way because he liked things in a nice order too. And whenever he went upstairs, he went up two at a time, always starting with his right foot. Mr. Jeevon said I was a very clever boy. I said I wasn't very clever. I was just noticing how things were. That wasn't clever. That was just being observant. Being clever was when you looked at how things were and use the evidence to work out something new, like the universe expanding, or who committed a murder. Or if you could see someone's name and you give each letter a value from one to 26, A equals one, B equals two, etc., and you add the numbers up in your head and you find that it makes a prime number, like Jesus Christ, 151, or Scooby-Doo, 113. Mr. Jeevons asked me whether this made me feel safe, having things always in a nice order. And I said it did. Then he asked if I didn't like things changing. And I said I wouldn't mind things changing if I became an astronaut, for example, which is one of the biggest changes you can imagine, apart from becoming a girl or dying. He asked whether I wanted to become an astronaut, and I said I did. He said that it was very very difficult to become an astronaut. I said that I knew. You had to become an officer in the Air Force and you had to take lots of orders and be prepared to kill other human beings. And I couldn't take orders. Also, I don't have 20-20 vision and you needed that to be a pilot. But I said that you could still want something that is very unlikely to happen. Terry who is an older brother of Francis, who was at the school, said I would only ever get a job collecting supermarket trolleys or cleaning out donkey poo and animal sanctuary. And that they didn't let spazzers drive rockets and cost billions of pounds. When I told this to father, he said that Terry was jealous of my being cleverer than him, which was a stupid thing to think because we weren't in a competition, but Terry is stupid. I'm not a spazzer, which means spastic, not like Francis, who is a spazzer. And even though I probably won't become an astronaut, I'm going to go to university and study mathematics or physics or physics and mathematics because I like mathematics and physics and I'm very good at them.
but Terry won't go to university. Father says Terry is most likely to end up in prison. Terry has a tattoo on his arm of a heart shape with a knife through the middle of it. But this is what I call digression. And now I'm going to go back to the fact that it was a good day because it was a good day. I decided that I would try and find out who killed Wellington because a good day is a day for projects and planning things. When I said this to Siobhan, she said, well, we're meant to be writing stories today. So why don't you write about finding Wellington and going to the police station? And that is when I started writing this. Mother died two weeks later. I had not been into the hospital to see her, but father had taken in lots of food from Marks and Spencer's. He said that she had been doing okay and seemed to be getting better. She had sent me lots of love and, my get, and had my get well card on the table beside her. Father said she liked it very much. Father said that she died of a heart attack and it wasn't expected. I said, what kind of heart attack? Because I was surprised. Mother was only 38 years old and heart attacks usually happen to older people. And mother was very active and rode a bicycle and ate food which was healthy and high in fibre and low in saturated fat like chickens and vegetables and muesli. Father said that he didn't know what kind of heart attack she had and now wasn't the moment to be asking questions like that. I said it was probably an aneurysm. Father said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I'm really sorry, but it wasn't his fault. Then Mrs Shears came over and cooked supper for us and she was wearing sandals and jeans and a t-shirt which had the words windsurf and Corfu and a picture of a windsurfer on it. Father was sitting down and she stood next to him and held his head against her and said, come on, Ed, we're going to get through this. Then she made a spaghetti and tomato sauce. After dinner, she played Scrabble with me and I beat her 247 points to 134. I decided that I was going to find out who killed Wellington, even though father had told me to stay out of other people's business. This is because I do not always do what I am told. And this is because when people tell you what to do, it is usually confusing and does not make sense. For example, people often say, be quiet, but they don't tell you how long to be quiet for. Or you see a sign which says, keep off the grass. But it should say, keep off the grass around this sign or keep off all the grass in this park because there is lots of grass you are allowed to walk on. Also, people break rules all the time. For example, father often drives at over 30 miles per hour in a 30 miles per hour zone. Sometimes he drives when he's been drinking and often he doesn't wear his seatbelt when he's driving his van. And in the Bible, it says, thou shalt not kill but they were the Crusades and two world wars and the Gulf War, and there were Christians killing people in all of them. Also, I don't know what father means when he says, stay out of other people's business, because I do not know what he means by other people's business, because I do lots of things with other people at school and in the shop and on the bus, and his job is going into other people's houses and fixing their boilers and their heating. And all of those things are other people's business. Siobhan understands. When she tells me not to do something, she tells me exactly what it is that I am not allowed to do. And I like this. For example, she once said, you must never punch Sarah or hit her in any way, Christopher, even if she hits you first. If she does hit you again, move away from her and stand still and count from one to 50. Then come and tell me what she has done or tell one of the other members of staff what she has done. Or for example, she once said, if you want to go on the swings 
and there are already people on the swings, you must never push them off. You must ask them if you can have a go. Then you must wait until they have finished. But when other people tell you what you can't do, they don't do it like this. So I decide for myself what I am going to do and what I am not going to do. That evening, I went round to Mrs Shear's house and knocked on the door and waited for her to answer. When she opened the door, she was holding a mug of tea and she was wearing sheepskin slippers and she'd been watching a quiz programme on the television because there was a television on and I could hear someone saying, the capital city of Venezuela is A, Maracas, B, Caracas, C, Bogota, or D, Georgetown. And I knew that it was Caracas. She said, Christopher, I really don't think I want to see you right now. I said, I didn't kill Wellington. And she replied, what are you doing here? I said, I want to come and tell you that I didn't kill Wellington. And also, I want to find out who killed him. Some of her tea spilled on the carpet. I said, do you know who killed Wellington? She didn't answer my question. She just said, goodbye, Christopher, and closed the door. Then I decided to do some detective work. I could see that she was watching me and waiting for me to leave because I could see her standing in her hall on the other side of the frosted glass in her front door. So I walked down the path and out of the garden. Then I turned round and saw that she wasn't standing in her hall any longer. I made sure that there was no one watching, climbed over the wall, walked down the side of the house into the back garden to the shed where she kept all of her gardening tools. The shed was locked with a padlock and I couldn't go inside so I walked round to the window, to the side. Then I had some good luck. When I looked through the window, I could see a fork that looked exactly like the same fork that had been sticking out of Wellington. It was lying on the bench by the window and it had been cleaned because there was no blood on the spikes. I could see that some of the tools there as well, a spade and a rake and one of those long clippers people use for cutting branches, which are too high to reach. And they all had the same green plastic handles in the fork, like the fork. This meant that the fork belonged to Mrs Shears. Either that or it was a red herring, which is a clue which makes you come to a wrong conclusion or something which looks like a clue, but it isn't. I wondered if Mrs Shears had killed Wellington herself. But if she had killed Wellington herself, why did she come out of the house shouting, what have you done to my dog? I thought that Mrs Shears probably didn't kill Wellington, but whoever had killed him had probably killed him with Mrs Shears' fork and the shed was locked. This meant that it was someone who had the key to Mrs Shears' shed or that she had left it unlocked or that she had left her fork lying around in the garden. I heard a noise and turned around and saw Mrs Shears standing on the lawn looking at me. I said, I came to see if the fork was in the shed. And she said, if you don't go now, I'll call the police again. So I went home. When I got home, I said hello to father, went upstairs and fed Toby, my rat, and felt happy because I was being a detective and finding things out. And I think that's where we'll need to stop for this week's reading. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely evening. See you next time. Amy? Yes. Can you stay for a second? I think your student, Xenia, wants to join you and say a few words. Okay, no problem. One second.
Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. So I really, really like this story. It was amazing and crazy, quite crazy. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. Oh, I don't know what's just happened there. I'll wait for a moment. I think she's gone now, sorry. Don't know where it could be her connection. <laughs> but she managed to say uh, the most important thing. Th thank you very much uh, for today. We all thank really enjoyed it. It brings the live theater back. We all miss it. And we congratulate all the actors in the world and production team. They're having a really hard time right now and just wanted to say we miss you all and we can't wait to get those tickets to live shows but in the meantime amy thank you very much for your time today no problem thank you bye bye bye